If you were to appear before God today, would you be able, and would he be able to identify acts of compassion that you have performed? The last story I want to tell you is about a doctor up in Canada. I was working with a group and one of the men said to me, he had, we, we were talking about uh, compassion, I guess. And he came up and he handed me a little yellow piece of paper. He said, my wife had cancer of the tongue. And he said, every day I'd go to visit her in the hospital and I would talk to her, but she couldn't talk, so she had this pad and she would write me a note. And she said, this is the very last note he, she gave me. And I said, would you share it with the group? And he said, I couldn't. I said, it's okay. And the next day he came to me and he said, I shared it with some other people. They told me I need to share this, but they, I want you to share it. So I got up and I read it. The note said, I am so fortunate to have Dr. So-and-so as my doctor. He is the most compassionate person I've ever met. She said yesterday when I had to go down to the, for an x-ray, she said he knew how scared I was. So he stayed with me the whole time. He put his hand underneath the sheet, grabbed my hand, held on to me, and stayed with me the whole time. I knew how busy he was, but he stayed with me. I am so, compass I am so fortunate to have him as a compassionate human being. During the week that's coming up, I want you to spend a little time thinking to yourself at the end of each day, where was God calling me to be compassionate? Who were the people that I met today that were crying for compassion? Could I ask you to stand up just for a second so that if you're, sit you're sitting a long time. Oh, you can talk, you know. <laughs> okay, you can sit down again, that's good. I am just looking up here at this front row and all I, all I can think of, I've worked, one of the times I was working with the priest of the Los Angeles Archdiocese and Cardinal Mahoney was there and he got up and he, he said, I have an announcement to make. He said, as of October the 1st, we will have optional celibacy for anyone sitting in the front row. <laughs> and of course, there were no priests in the front row. I want to talk about forgiveness, which to me is the essence of spirituality, and I'll show you why, I'll tell you why. But you can never understand forgiveness unless you understand anger. And you've got a hand out there on this, if you want to look at it. I'd ask you to think about a time when you felt angry. If you can't think of one, please see me at the break, or at the end, because you've got some problems, okay? But I want you to think about a time you felt angry, and then I want you to track it. There are five things that produce anger, I believe. There's probably more than five, but these are the five that I think. Frustration. Would it be possible for anyone as a Catholic to ever feel frustrated? <laughs> Frustration produces anger. Anytime there's a blow to your self-esteem, anytime you feel not appreciated, not valued, you'll feel angry. Anytime you experience injustice, you'll feel angry. For a lot of us, we have all three of them. We have anger times anger times anger, and it's called rage. Anytime there's physical harm, somebody hurts you, there will be anger. I was down working in Haiti right after the, the earthquake. What's the, any, somewhere near 300,000 people killed. And when you think of the anger that was there, and you could feel it when I went. But there's a fifth one that's not on your paper. Loss produces anger. One of the things I believe about our church today, we, we are a church that's going through a lot of loss. Closing parishes, combining parishes, all of that sorts of stuff. This, the pre God bless you, the pre-sexual abuse. It, it, we've lost a vision of the church that we knew. All I have to do is listen to Catholics talk today as they did a few years ago. But if you have any of those, those are the triggers of anger. Based on your belief system, the situation itself does not produce the emotion. Two of us can be in the same situation and not produce the same emotion. It's based upon my beliefs. I was doing a program at that university in the Midwest, the one that used to have a football team called Notre something. <laughs> and when I started, I was going to spend a couple of hours on anger with that group. 
And when I got up there to talk, a guy came, took his chair, went to the back of the room, turned his chair around, and for the whole two hours that I talked on anger, he sat with his back to me doing crossword puzzles. You think I felt a little angry? I could feel the emotion just rising. And I remember at one point when the talk was over, I saw him walking towards me. And he said, can, you, can I talk to you? And I said, yes. And he said, throughout my whole life, I've been so afraid of anger. I've never been able to listen to anybody talk about it. And I've never been able to, to, to read anything about it. It scares me too much. He said, but I forced myself to stay in this room today and listen to you. What do you think happened to my anger at that moment? The other person does not produce my anger. I produce my anger. My anger comes from my beliefs and my perceptions. Then once I feel the anger, what do I do about it? And that will depend upon what my belief systems are about anger. We're okay. One time I was doing a program for the bishops of the United States in terms of their role as leaders in the collaborative church. And about halfway through the talk, I said, anger isn't a sin, anger isn't wrong, anger is just an emotion. I saw the hand of an archbishop go up. He said, young man, now, anytime anybody calls me young man, I know I'm in deep trouble, okay? Just for a moment, thinking about young, old. I heard a woman interviewed on the radio who was 104 years of age. They said, what's the best thing about being 104? She said, you have no peer pressure. <laughs> when I was in Australia, there was a bishop they told me about, Daniel Mannix, who was 99 years of age and he was still the bishop. And they said on his 99th birthday, somebody came to interview him from the newspaper. And the guy got so excited, he said, Archbishop, I only hope I have the opportunity to interview you again next year. And the Archbishop looked at him and said, I don't see why not, you look healthy enough. <laughs> one last one back to the serious stuff, okay? Agatha Christie, who wrote all the murder mysteries, did you know she was married to a biblical archaeologist, those folks who go out and dig up everything? And they said to her, what's it like to be married to a biblical archaeologist? She said, it's wonderful. The older you get, the more interesting he finds you. <laughs> anyway, this bishop challenged me. He said, did you forget that anger is one of the seven capital sins? Now, what do you do when an archbishop tells you you don't know what you're talking about? Fortunately, everybody else in the room were bishops. So I figured, I'm not touching this one. I said, how would you guys answer? And one by one, they said things like, it says in the scripture, be angry, but sin not. So it can't be a sin. And they went on with quotes like that. Jesus was angry, and Jesus couldn't sin. He didn't buy it. He just sat there like this. He also died before the year was out. Because people hold on to their anger. It affects them physically. By the way, after that was over, I went back to look up the seven capital sins because he said to me, it's one of the seven capital sins. You know that anger is no longer listed as one of the seven capital sins? It's been replaced by the word wrath, W-R-A-T-H. I believe anger is the emotion, wrath is the behavior. But what you believe about your, your uh, what you believe about anger will affect what you do with it. If you believe it's wrong, you'll store it. All of those sorts of things will happen to you. It will affect you physically, it will affect you emotionally, uh, you, you'll blow up at people, have all that sort of stuff. If you want to express it, you can do it either constructively or destructively. Destructively, you turn it into some form of hostility. I want to talk about constructively what you can do with your anger. First, feel, think, talk, act. Get in touch with the feeling. Think about it. Talk with somebody about it and then decide what you want to do with that energy, because anger is energy. Second one is not on your paper. Pity or compassion. You know that it, I, found, I find, for me, it's impossible to hold on to my anger when I can feel pity or compassion for the other person. But do you know that the treatment of choice for anger is forgiveness? It is the only thing that will heal anger. John Paul II said that if you look through the scriptures, there are just two gestures that are characteristic of Jesus. So if I want to be holy, I want to be spiritual, I want to be like Jesus, I better listen. He said the two characteristics are healing and forgiveness. 
I believe that one of the essences of a spirituality for us as Christians, Catholic Christians, is forgiveness. I'm only going to go for about seven more minutes or so, so try to stay with me. The best theological article I ever read on forgiveness was in that theological journal called Time Magazine. <laughs> January 9th, 1984. The Pope and Ark are the man that shot him. That article says, I went to, the Pope went to jail to forgive his would-be assassin. It said the startling drama of forgiveness and reconciliation. Please realize those are not the same thing. I'll come back to them. It was not just a private act, it said. It was a message to the world. This secular magazine says that forgiveness is the essence of what it means to be a Christian. This secular magazine says Christ preached forgiveness. It's at the center of the New Testament. It goes on and on like that, challenging us to be forgiving. But you see that question right there on the cover? Think for yourself, if you want to be like Jesus, if you want to grow in spirituality, I'm suggesting that you become a more forgiving person. But I find that many of us hold on to anger. And if you're holding on to your anger, ask yourself why. Why? Why don't I forgive? I, 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 I work it out with you and ask you your reasons, but let me just give you a couple. The Catechism, I love it. When we say the Our Father, right after the Our Father in the Gospel of Matthew, it ends up by saying, if you forgive others, God forgives you. Hey, nice going, folks. But if you do not forgive, neither will God forgive you. And in the New Catechism, under the section on the Our Father, this is what it says. It says, now, and this is daunting, the outpouring of God's love and God's mercy cannot trade our hearts unless we forgive those who have offended us. And if we don't get the message, it says, in refusing to forgive our brothers and sisters, our hearts are closed, and their hardness makes them impervious to God's merciful love. Our hearts are closed if we don't forgive. God's love, God's mercy cannot enter if I don't forgive. I want to just give you two things. I'm right on time, I think. Whoops. Yeah. I want to distinguish between forgiveness, reconciliation, and justice. By the way, if you don't forgive, if you, if you hold on to your anger, I said before, briefly, that your anger will destroy your body. It destroys your body. So think about it. If I hold on to my anger and I don't forgive, I'm dying on behalf of someone I don't even like. Someone said holding resentments is like letting someone you hate live rent-free in your head full-time. Somebody else said to me, holding resentments is like taking poison and waiting for the other person to die. It destroys you. Forgiveness is an act of the will. It's a choice that I make to let go of the desire to get even with somebody who has hurt me. No one can ever stop you from forgiving. You have complete control over forgiveness. Complete control. So every day of your life, you make a choice. Will I forgive or will I hold on to this thing that is killing me? Will I be like Jesus or will I be the opposite of Jesus? Reconciliation you have no, no control over, none. All you can ever do, and you've seen this in families and with friends, is to attempt at reconciliation. But if the other person doesn't want to become reconciled, you can't make it happen. You do not have control over reconciliation. But there's a third element that comes up in this article. It's the issue of justice. When you forgive, I hope I'm not standing in front of that, I apologize. Forgiveness does not remove the responsibility for justice. I was doing a program one time it was for a diaconate community. And I asked the question, who's modeled forgiveness for you? And everybody in the audience turned to look at a couple sitting in the corner. And I said, what's your story? I said, we had a daughter, her name was Christina. 
Christina was kidnapped, raped, and murdered. They said it took a long time, but finally they arrested one of our neighbors. And then it was about a year between the death of Christina and when he was finally convicted. And they said we had a long time to think about it, to pray about it, to talk about it. Because you don't rush to forgiveness. If you rush to forgiveness, all you get is a pseudo-forgiveness. They said, we went to the judge after this man's conviction. And they said to him, judge, we forgive this man for what he did to Christina. Now, when they forgave, were they saying this man didn't have to pay his penalty? No, they said to the judge, judge, we forgive this man. They said, judge, please do not give him the death penalty because Christina loved life. But they said, this is a dangerous man. We've watched him beat his wife up. We've seen him with a gun chasing a neighbor. So please keep him in jail, but we forgive him. When you forgive, it does not take away the responsibility for justice. And finally, when you forgive, it does not condone the behavior of the others. The major reason why people don't forgive, there are two reasons. Second major one is they've never forgiven themselves. But the major reason is because they don't have any models of forgiveness. I want you to think for yourself, who's your model of forgiveness? Who's modeled forgiveness for you? Who in your family or parish has been a model of forgiveness for you? And finally, when have you modeled forgiveness for your family and your community? What will happen to the next generation if you, the parents and grandparents, don't model what it means to forgive. I'll just give you a couple. We'll end with a prayer, and then you'll have some time to ask questions. He had been ordained 50 years. He was from Yugoslavia. And he told me the year he was ordained, the communists came into his hometown. They killed his father, his mother, and his seven brothers and sisters. They wiped out his entire family. He said, it took me five years before I could write to the man who killed my family and tell him I forgave him. He said it was 25 years before I got back to Yugoslavia. And he said the first thing I did is I searched out the man who killed my family. I went to him and I told him I forgave him. I don't cry easily, but I cried that day. Because there are people in my life I haven't forgiven yet for slamming a door in my face. It was a red door, January 21st. I remember everything about it, but I've held on to it, which is stupid and dumb. I'll just give you two more. Um, Carol, the sister I work with and I were doing a parish mission in New York and where we were standing at night when people were coming in to the church you could look over and you would have seen where the Twin Towers used to be and Carol the night before had talked at the mission about forgiveness and a woman came right up to Carol and she said last night when you were talking about forgiveness she said I was getting so angry she said my son was killed on 9-11 and she said, I have such hatred toward those men who killed my son. She said, but it suddenly dawned on me last night that my hatred is killing me. They not only killed my son, I'm allowing them to kill me. And she said, I made a decision last night. I have to begin the process of forgiveness. Not to forgive. It's a process. It takes time. There are steps. She said, I have to begin the process of forgiveness or else they will also kill me, and I will let them. Last story. Working in Canada, year of Jubilee. They gave me four themes. One of them was forgiveness and reconciliation. And the next day a woman came in and she handed me a playbill, and I usually bring it, I forgot it, but I think I remember it. It said, this play is dedicated to the memories of Nancy Campbell and Frankie Garner. On Tuesday, September the 7th, my sister with Nancy Campbell was brutally murdered in her home, stabbed over and over with scissors until the kitchen floor was flooded with her blood. Such hatred filled my family against that killer, for he took our Nancy away. The killer drove away and committed suicide. 
He said, I remember going, his name was Frankie. He said, I remember going to his funeral and asking God's blessing on him. He said, I remember going up and kissing his mother and asking and praying for her. And he said, at that moment, our family felt God's peace. Now remember the Our Father. God's love, God's peace, God's forgiveness cannot enter our hearts until we forgive others. I'm going to end with the prayer we started with, but I want to change the wording a little bit. Let me go back a second. This is what I hope you would reflect on. Where and how is God calling you to grow spiritually, and what will you do? But this is the prayer we said in the beginning, but I remember it said, Christ has no hands but yours. I want you now to say that prayer personally. I want you to mean it. Because for me, this is what a living spirituality is about. Could we say it? Christ has no body now but mine. No hands, no feet on earth but mine. I am the eyes through which he looked, compassion on the world. I am the feet with which he walked to do good. I am his hands, I am his feet, I am his eyes, we are his body. Amen. I invite you to take a moment or two to see if there's any questions or challenges or insights that you would like to share. We have about 10 minutes. So just reflect for a moment and think. And if there's anybody else that was planning to say something, just come right on up so we we won't waste too much time. Brother, it's often said, I've often heard it, I'm going to forgive, but I'm not going to forget. Could Did you, everybody hear the question? Go ahead. Could you shed some yes. thoughts? Give us some thoughts yeah. on that. I, I asked a theologian that question one time. Do you think that couple whose daughter was killed will ever forget it? No. This man said to me, Christianity is not about forgetting. Christianity is about remembering. And every time I remember, I have to forgive again. That's the 70 times 7. We have to keep forgiving. We will never forget the really tough things. Nor should, if we do, it's probably some sort of a defense mechanism. Oh, I thought you were coming. <laughs> Anybody else question, comment, observation? Inside challenge? Come on up. And please, a couple of others, so that we can, this helps to broaden it and to get away from that. I got you. Brother, in your presentation, <clears throat> I thought I heard you say, um, and I think it was up on the screen, that even though there is forgiveness, that there has to be justice. And I'm wondering, as a woman in the church, I don't know how we bring justice to people who are not accountable to anyone. Yeah. And what do you do with the anger that you have? Wonderful question. But I did not say you can't have forgiveness without justice. I, I didn't say that. I said that, um, uh, that when you, we see, go back to where I said, when you forgive, it doesn't mean that justice doesn't have to be paid. So maybe it is the same. Um, yeah, one of the things that's going on very much in the church today, particularly with women, and particularly with women religious, is the injustice that's being done. Um, but remember that it is not the situation that causes the emotion, it's my beliefs and my perceptions that produce my emotions. The toughest, the toughest forgiveness to deal with, I'm sorry, I'm going to stand over here, is when you have, a, when you have an anger towards a them, towards an institution, towards a church, towards the bishops, whatever it may be. It is very difficult to forgive when it's not personal. And I think we have to try to find ways to make it more personal. Who is it that I am angry at? This bishop, not every bishop, this person, and, di and then you can direct. Otherwise, it just becomes overwhelming within us. And 
I didn't say this before, but when that anger builds up, I just hinted at it. It affects you physically. It affects you emotionally. Let me, let me take a moment on that. When you feel angry, you produce too much ACTH, too much cortisol, too much metacortisol, too much adrenaline, and you keep pouring too much of that into your body day after day after day, it will destroy your body. It will cause illnesses, strokes, heart attacks, death. And so you have to find a way to get rid of the anger. And I believe the best way is to forgive. It doesn't mean you're saying what they did is okay. And it doesn't mean, I didn't say this and I should have. Anger is energy. And you use that energy to say, how do I overcome and how do I fight against what is unjust? But that's what we have to do. Anybody else? Please, yeah, I'm going to have to ask you to come up so people will hear you. And if there's anybody else, just come up so we'll take advantage of the time we have. While she's coming up, and we'll just... I did leave some of our books back there. If you wanted to purchase any or take them with you and send me a check later, you can do that. But before I pick this up, um, don't believe everything you read. <laughs> no, this is very important. Did you hear about the, the family that lived here in the Cape? And the a patriarch was 100 years of age. And on his 100th birthday, the family wanted to do something really special for him. So they hired a professional biographer. She came, did the family history, she came back. She said, you have an interesting family, especially your Uncle George. So we don't have an Uncle George. They said, yes, you do. Your father had a brother who in the 1920s, 1930s, moved from the Cape to Chicago, Illinois, where he worked for a man by the name of Al Capone. <laughs> and his job was to protect the liquor. And one day as he was protecting the liquor, F liquor, FBI agents came running in, shots are fired, when the air cleared, Uncle George had accidentally, he didn't mean to do it, shot and killed an FBI agent. As a result, he was put on trial, a very sensational trial. When the trial was over, he was convicted, sent to Sing Sing, strapped in the electric chair, died. Family said, please don't write the family history, you'll embarrass our father. Now remember the moral of the story. Don't believe everything you read. When the biography came out, the family immediately went to the section on Uncle George, which said, Uncle George, was a man who made a killing in his profession. <laughs> it said, in spite of his many trials and because of his deep convictions, he achieved a chair of applied electronics <laughs> at a major government institution. He was tied to his position by the strongest of bonds. And when the hour of death came, it came as a real shock. Back to the series. <laughs> Thank you, brother. I, I just wanted to share um, the Thank anger you. thing. Yeah. What Jesus said from the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Yeah. That has helped me the most. Thank you very much for saying that. Just, the question that comes with that for me is did Jesus forgive the people who crucified him? I've talked to theologians about this. And at least one theologian said to me, he didn't forgive. Listen to the language. He said, Father, forgive them. And what this theologian said is that when you're in so much pain, you may not be able to forgive right then. And all you can do is ask God to do the forgiving and then keep working at it. Thank you. Thank you. Boy, that, that was right on time. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And Maybe if the weather had cooperated, we could have had even more people here uh, tonight. But thank you for coming out on such a, an awful night as well. We'll see you in July. I don't remember the date. The 19th? The 19th. It's, it's a very interesting talk on spirituality and immigration. Uh, it's a Holy Cross father from that Notre Dame University uh, <laughs> that, that'll be here. And I hope he does the same thing he did for the priests of Fall River. His uh, PowerPoint is, is really spectacular. It'll keep you engaged for the, for the time. He's also a movie maker, but I hope he doesn't show his movies <laughs> as well. Thanks a lot. Have, Thank you. have some coffee or whatever you want. <laughs>